and we were just talking about it and I was like, we are not even those same people. Like it almost feels like um, I like lived a whole different reality. I was looking for love and acceptance in all the wrong places. It just like blurred like my morals and values for a while. The closer you get to God, the more the devil's gonna try to throw things your way to like knock you off the path. It might knock you off the path, but you just get back up, dust off your pants and get back on it. There was like a pivotal moment though when it all changed. Is this when you got arrested? Yes. Hey y'all, welcome back to the Salty Podcast. Today I am so excited that I have my very first guest, other than my husband, my sister Sage. Hi. I'm so excited. I know. I'm, I'm so kind of nervous, but this is exciting. <laughs> We've it's been so, talking about this for a while, so. I know. Um, you've been here over a week now. Mm -hmm. And I've been sick for the past week, unfortunately. So Sage wasn't here a lot. And anyway, so now I'm better. So we're here together, going to film. I'm so excited. I'm excited too. I'm excited to have this intentional conversation. Yeah. Because that's what this is. is yeah. We're just having an uninterrupted, really deep conversation. I already feel like I'm about to cry. And I don't know why. I think it's just because I'm nervous. I can see your <laughs> eyes. They have um, some water swelling. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Let's just start out fun. Let's talk about us growing up together. I mean, we were, we have a lot of sisters, yeah. brother. There's a ton of us. Every time somebody asks, I have to like recount. Mm -hmm. I don't have like just the, the number in my head. I have to get on my fingers and count. Oh, no, definitely me too. You would think by now we'd have the number down. Well, now I have it down. I have it burned in my brain. There's nine of us all together. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a lot. Nine. Um, so let's go back to memory lane. Okay. So there is the memory, the pictures we found of mom had me in the mm -hmm. hospital and you of the video and you came and met me for the first time. Yes. So, so I feel sweet. like you've always been like, I feel like Ivy's going to be like you. Like you've always had that mother intuition type thing, which is, yeah. you're not a mom yet. No, I'm not even a mom. I'm a dog mama. But, yeah. um, well, yeah, there were so many of y'all of us and I was the oldest girl. So like, it kind of was my role to like help take care of you. I'm sure mom was always like, Sage, can you help me do this? And so just growing up, even as we got older, it was like, you know, I was the first one to get a car and the first one to drive. So I was driving y'all everywhere, picking you up from school, going down the store to the grocery store, going down the road to the grocery store. That was my job was to watch y'all. Yeah. Did you feel like a pressure or did it just come naturally? I don't think I ever remembered feeling a pressure. I guess it just was natural. There were times when I got older that I was like, Ugh, I don't want to go pick them up from school. Like, I don't want to go hang out and, like, have all my little sisters with me. <laughs> like, it wasn't cool. Yeah. But now that we're all, like, grown and stuff, I love having so many siblings. I know. I it's so much fun. And when we all have kids one day, like, they have, like, cousins, that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, for sure. You know, you had you took on that big sister role so well. What would you say you struggled with the most in your childhood? Uh... I wasn't prepared for this question. <laughs> um, it was hard to like know you were the older sister and you had all these like younger people like looking up to you. Um, so that well, I guess was kind of hard. Even at a younger age, like I knew I was supposed to like be a role model for y'all. And like I was experiencing everything for the first time too. So like I made all these mistakes like we all do, but like I had all these little ones like looking up to me. And I know that you shared that like you learned from like mine and Logan's mistakes. Yeah. So you were more of like the goody tissues right. because you didn't want to do what we did because you saw how we were punished for what we did. Right. You learned from us. So we got to do everything for you. Exactly. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. I'll take it. Um, but yeah, I definitely, I was, when we were really little, I think we were all pretty sweet. We were all good girls. We did what we were supposed to. And it wasn't really until I think I got into high school that I really started kind of pushing the boundary. Yeah. Um, I was more sneaky to try to get away because we also, my mom and dad divorced when we were like really little. Yeah. And so How mom, old were you? Because I was two. So that would have made you I like, was like four. four. Yeah. Do you remember the divorce? No, I have one memory 
And it's the only memory I have probably of that age. And I remember like sitting on the Adrian house, like I was like underneath the kitchen counter on the little like half bar thing, sitting under there. And I just remember like mom was on one side of the room and dad was on the other and they were arguing back and forth. And I was just like, kind of like watching them. I didn't probably know what was going on, Yeah, but like, but that's it. That's the only memory I have. Okay. I wonder if it's the same because two years old, that's how old uh-huh. I was. That's like the earliest memory I have of them. They were, we were in the Adrian house and mm-hmm. I was sitting on the step. And they were fighting. And so I wonder if that was the same same argument. What if it was? That would be so weird. Because that was like a pivotal moment. Because after that was when all else broke loose, you know? Yeah. So very interesting how we that the same. Is our trauma bond. Yeah. (laughs) We need to ask Logan where (laughs) she was in the mix. (laughs) She was there. Yeah. As you got older, you said you started pushing boundaries a little bit? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So they divorced when we were little. And... Mom was like the strict household. Um, Dad was like the more lenient, I guess, like fun household. When we were, what, whenever you're a teenager, like what your idea of like fun is, at least for me, that's what dad's house was. Um, You know, if I wanted to have a slumber party or spend the night with my friends, um, I just asked and he usually said yes. He didn't like call and check in. Um, He just trusted us, I think, too much. And then mom was just like, I guess because of how mom grew up, she was a lot more strict because of that. And so, you know, we knew better than to like ask to spend the night with somebody. Usually if we were with her, especially if it was me and I was trying to be sneaky, I knew I couldn't because she was going to call and ask so-and-so's mom if it was okay and then make sure she knew what we were doing at all times. And so you just knew you couldn't get away with much. So I didn't even ask. I respect that so much. I'm like, I'm going to do that for It's a complete 180. Like now I'm like, I see why you were as strict as you were and I'm glad that she was a strict because if I had had full leniency, yeah. then like, I mean, I, I could have turned out so different. All of yeah. us would have. So like having the strict and not strict, I feel like maybe was a good balance. But also I know that like growing up, it was also hard too. Yeah. Because I feel like the reason I was as sneaky as I was is because I was, there was so, it was so strict that like I couldn't really do anything that I felt like I wanted to do yeah. without being sneaky. And that like just led into problems. So yeah. Well, let's talk about some of your, okay, (laughs) let's get into it. Some of the things that I learned from you. Okay. Um, I do remember there was this one time and we don't have to go in detail about what this is. Okay. But I feel like there was one moment for me and you in our relationship, whenever I came to you and I just cried Mm -hmm. because I was disappointed. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? I think so. So how did that make you do you want to talk about it like how did that make you feel as in terms of being a big sister well I was already disappointed in myself like I had already kind of felt the guilt and shame of the situation and then like you come into me too and tell me that it let me down it broke my heart (laughs) because I always want to be I wanted to be a good big sister I wanted to be a role model not just for like you but like other girls who were younger than me or girls my age. So I already was like carrying the guilt and shame of all that myself. And then like, it was just like confirmed, I guess, whenever it came from you. Yeah. But I'm glad that you came to me too, because like, it was just, a, it was kind of like a, like a slap on the wrist or like a wake up call for me. It was like, Sage, you got to get your act together. Like people see you yeah. and your sisters, they see you and the way that you're living. And I knew the way that I was living like things I was doing weren't right anyways like in God's eyes so I felt like I was disappointing God I feel like I have a lot of regrets from when I was growing up but on the same hand I know that all those experiences molded me into who I am now and I'm proud of who I am now and um and I feel like I'm like a living testimony for girls who I know went through the same thing for sure yeah Yeah, I know that's so I'm proud of you and that's like the thing is because I remember Whenever I came to you, it wasn't in a place of judgment. It was more of just... You were checking on me. Yeah. And you wanted to make sure I was like not headed down a a wrong road. Right. Because outside looking in, if it weren't for the actions, I guess, Mm -hmm. you went, you took in certain things. I mean, you were a good girl, you know? I mean, you were so kind, sweet. Yeah. I think it would shock a lot of people to hear what you... Oh, it it would. I mean, even now, like... Not long ago, I was talking to a friend who like, grew up with me through all that, and we were just talking about it. And I was like, 
we are not even those same people. Like it almost feels like um, I like lived a whole different reality. Yeah. Um, because I was, I feel like I was a sweet, genuine person back then, but it's like I was looking for love and acceptance in all the wrong places. And that kind of just like, I don't know, it just like blurred like my morals and values for a while. There was like a pivotal moment that when it all changed and I was like, I was like, Sage, what are you doing? Like, this is not how you were raised. This is not the person that you like want to be. Like, you're not going to find your future husband living this way. Um, is this when you got so, arrested? Yes, I did get arrested. Can, do you want to? Do you care if we talk no, about I don't, it? No, I'm an open book. Honestly, okay, let's um, talk about it. Okay, so I went to a party in high school, and there was a bunch of people there. Everybody was drinking and just hanging out. There were no parents there, and honestly, I mean, it was just I want to say like it was just innocent high school fun, but it was I guess it wasn't all that innocent. I mean, we were drinking underage, and that's you know. No bueno, don't do that. But I was doing that, and there was, like, a noise complaint called. And rumor has it that it was actually somebody who was, like, at the party, like like a, a significant other of someone who, like, wasn't there and was mad at that person, like, called, like, intentionally. Oh, really? I don't know if that's true. But that's what was going around. But anyway, cops got called. Cops showed up. They beat on the door, and then some of the guys that were there were just like, you can't come in without oh, a warrant. No. So, honestly, probably wouldn't have been as bad as it was if that hadn't happened, but that just made the cops mad. Oh, uh, yeah, because these so, teenage boys are telling them. Yeah, I know. Okay. So... Um, so everybody was hiding cause we were like, oh my gosh, you know, cause everybody there was drinking. We knew we'd be in trouble. Some people were like in the backyard and they actually like ran away and got away because they ran. But I was inside and I was inside with my friend and we were hiding under the bed. Well, cops come in and they're just getting everybody out of the house. They're like everybody outside right now. And I am like trying to make up my mind if I want to stay hidden under the bed, but I'm also so worried that I'm going to be like found out and then that would be worse for me. So, but I didn't have to make that decision for myself because my friend was like, she made it for she you. She dragged, she grabbed my ankle and dragged me out from under the bed. She said, if I'm going down, you're going down with me. I know. But the thing is, so I was 18. She had not turned 18. So there were a few people at the party who had not turned 18, so they couldn't be arrested yet. Okay. So we're all outside on the patio and the cops are just like fishing for information. They're like, who bought y'all all these drinks? Like, um you know, where'd y'all get it from? Just, they're really trying to scare us and intimidate us, yeah. I think, to teach us a lesson. Um, well, next thing you know, this lady cop grabs my hands and she puts my hands behind my back and she puts handcuffs on me. Oh, it gives me chills. I lost it because y'all, I do some, I did some bad things, but I was a good girl. You were. Yeah. Like, no, no one in my family, no one, you know, at school, at church, nobody would have ever anticipated this from me. Or me, myself. I mean, this was what, like, nightmares were made of. So I'm arrested, and they walk me to the car, put me in the car. There was only one other girl there that was 18. Everybody else was, like, had birthdays coming up. One guy, bless his heart, that night was his 18th birthday. So he got arrested, too. So he got arrested, too. So they were, like, maybe, like, eight guys, and then just two girls okay. got arrested. But we sat in the back of the cop car, me and this other girl, like, all night while the cops were, like, getting, writing their reports and stuff. Did it and feel then, like... Eternity. It felt like forever, especially because I had to go to the restroom. Oh, no. And I had, I finally, I waited for like somebody to come down to the car. And I was like, I have to go to the bathroom. And she was like, she was kind of rude. I mean, they were all just, they were, all the cops were really rude. And they were like, they're like, you need to hold it. And I was like, I, I, can't, I really can't. I've got to go. So she walked me to the restroom. She never even took my handcuffs off me. She just opened the door and closed the door behind oh, me. So you didn't wipe. No, what? I did. I found out in that moment that I could slip my hand out of the handcuff. No. So I slipped my hand out, used the restroom, cleaned up, and then just put my hand back in the handcuff. Oh, wow. And, and then she walked back up to the car. Drove us downtown to the police station, you know, took our mug shots, our fingerprints, all that stuff, and then put us in a cell. Me and this one other girl. It was cold. It was so loud and echoey. Um, we had to wear orange Crocs. I had to take my earrings off, take my shoes off. I kept my, like, regular clothes on. But I even had to take my ponytail out. And I was wearing, like, a pony, a party pony. Oh. So when I took my ponytail, I had, like, a big old crimp in my hair. <laughs> so I looked ghastly. And I had been crying my eyes out, so makeup smeared. Um, after we were in there, I don't know how long it was. It felt like a long time. They let another woman in the cell who, black and white striped jumpsuit, she came in there. And, she's, and we're like, what is she doing in here? Like, we were like, 
scared out of our minds. And then she just starts throwing up <gasps> in the little like toilet in the back in the back. And so it smells, it's loud. And then after that, they just come and took her out. It's like they put her in there to like scare us and like try to like yeah. teach us a lesson. Yeah. So after we spent the night in there. Um, At this point, had you gotten a phone call yet? Like, were you able to call? No, they kept us there for a while before they let us even make a phone call. Wow. Probably because they were like checking in all the other people too. Yeah. Um. So it just was a long process. So they give us, they tell me to come make my call. And I am like, oh my gosh, who do I want to call? Yeah. Like, how did you Who pick? do I call to tell them to come get me out of jail? So who'd you call? Um, I think I called grandmama's phone. Okay. Because this is, this is really sad. I was actually spending the night with grandmama that night. I don't know if you know this. And I told grandmama I wanted to spend the night with my friend. So she let me go spend the night with my friend, but I already knew I was like not going to spend out with a friend. I was going to a party. That was just like my reason to give her. Yeah. So I was like under grandmama's supervision really that night that I got arrested. Oh. So I call her, but it's also like in the middle of the night. So she doesn't answer. What, like what time? I don't know. I'm, there's no clock on the wall that I can read. Yeah. So I have no idea. It's just, I know it's in the middle of the night. And then um, I was so scared to call mom. I was so scared Wait, to call dad. So what did grandmama say? She didn't answer. Oh, she didn't answer. Okay. She did not answer. So I didn't get to talk to anybody. Because you didn't call mom or dad after that? No. Well, they gave you one call, and I chose to call grandmama, and yeah. grandmama didn't answer. So they let the next person call. And, of course, you know, their parents are probably already in the know. My, our family goes to sleep at, like, 730, so they were, like, lights out. So, okay. um, so it was, like, I get the next morning, um, someone comes in there and was like, Sage, like, come on, you're you're getting out. And I was like, but you hadn't called anybody. I hadn't called. So the word just was getting mm-hmm. out? Yes. Okay. So I walk out and my dad is standing there, literally the most disappointed face. And I swear right there in that moment, I just wanted to turn around and like go back to jail (laughs) because I knew I was, I was so sad. I was so scared of my punishment. I was so, I knew I had disappointed him so badly. So we get in the car. He doesn't say anything. He just nothing. So I'm just sitting there. I smell like it's just bad. And he drives me straight to grandma's house. Okay. I think I was, I think you were there. there. Mm-hmm. At that point, I had already heard the news. Yeah. It was just, your sister's gotten arrested. I had no detail. You were probably so disappointed Well, too. I was just like, what? Is she okay? Yeah. Because to me, we were so close. You were so nice. You were so like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So to me, it was just, I was scared for you yeah and the path that you were choosing I'm like I really hope she's gonna be good <laughs> I know. I know. so I went yeah and I don't remember who took me over there but I was there when I got when you there. walked in mm-hmm. I remember that and you walked in and I was just heartbroken for you I know well I couldn't tell if you were like mad at me or if you were just like sad I for was me so sad. Or well both. you had enough people mad at you yeah for me I was just you were my sister I yeah was so, oh, that- my roommate we slept in the bed together, you know? Yeah. So I'm like, what is my life turning into? (laughs) (laughs) So I walk in grandma's house and I just sit on the couch and I'm exhausted because I didn't sleep any. Yeah. And then I'm, I'm sad. I'm scared. And grandmama just all she, all grandmama says to me is I'm very disappointed in you. And that was enough. Like she, that's the worst thing she could have said. Um, so we stay around there. I don't really remember what else happened after that, but I remember like, I think mom came and drove me home and mom was just like, I mean, she wasn't like mean or angry, but just, she, she was disappointed. And she was like, what are you doing with your life? Like, if this isn't a wake up call from God that you're not doing the right thing, like, I don't know what is like, I don't know what else it would take. And I had a scholarship to Auburn at that point. And mom said, you're not going to Auburn. If you can't handle being in high school, like here in your hometown, like you're not going off to school. And that kind of broke me too, because like that was my plan. And honestly, you were a senior. yeah, I was a senior. And so I was grounded for a long, long time, but not, I didn't even want to go do anything at that point. Yeah. I was so sad. And even whenever we went to school the next week, just the looks from everybody and the punishment too, because a lot of the guys that got arrested were on the baseball team. So like, just, it was just sad. I mean, that was, it was like walking in with a scarlet letter on my chest, really. Because everybody knew. Everybody knew. Yeah. And everybody was judging me for it. Even the people who were at the party who didn't get arrested, but they were there doing the same thing. Even those people were like, 
felt like they were judging me. Yeah. And I was like, you were there too. But honestly, I don't think I would change any of that yeah. because that was the turning point where I was like, I've got to do something different. Like this is, I'm not living a life that's like glorifying to God. Mm-hmm. I'm not honoring him with my life and what I'm doing and my choices. So I'm glad that it happened because yeah. now like I have a story to tell and I feel like people can learn from it, either learn from it or if they're in that, then it can be what maybe pulls them out of yeah. that. Like I remember t- you talking to me about it and you know, typically it's a shot to your pride So a lot of times I feel like people might come at it as they're just, oh, well, it's that wasn't my fault or just play victim, you know, and you did it. Like you owned it and you knew you're like, this is not the way I'm supposed to be going. Yeah. To me, that was I learned more from you in that moment than Uh, if you were to say, I'm just so mad that that happened. That's unfair. Right. right. You know? Yeah. It was like, oh. And so from that point on, I feel like that's when your testimony really just like you turned to God. Yeah. You know? Speaking of like, I mean, you accepted God in your heart at a very young age. Mm -hmm. Like I was seven. Yeah. Okay. And it was Kelly, our stepmom at the time, who like led me like through the prayer and stuff. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's sweet. sweet. Okay. So walking through, you were a Christian from a very young age, um, grew up, then you went through your high school, Mm -hmm. all of that. Well, it wasn't... So after that, that was a turning point. And that was, I think, what like set me on like... I guess, a a different, like, trajectory. But it wasn't all, like, rainbows and butterflies. So everything was good, like, for the rest of high school. But then I went to college. I was, like, I followed a boyfriend to college, and he was in a fraternity, and I wasn't in a sorority or anything. I actually had, like, come home every weekend to work to make money to be in college. Mm -hmm. I was literally just there because he was there, honestly. And so I started going to, like, parties with him, and there was lots of drinking and stuff like that and just partying and stuff and but it was like it's like it wasn't as scary because they were literally like cops outside like just making sure no one left drunk like left and like got in a car but like they knew the underage drinking was going on yeah and I mean that's probably not very good but I guess that's on that might be how most colleges are but so I was still drinking and partying I had conviction the whole time I remember like almost every night laying my head on the pillow I was like like, I knew I wasn't doing right. Um, but it, I was just like, this is just what everybody does, you know? Yeah. And um, there was one night, me and my boyfriend and the people that we were with, we'd all had, like, way too much to drink. And I was actually, I was kind of, I was pretty okay. But my boyfriend was drunk, and they were all being stupid and playing with, like, tasers and stuff. Long story short, guy throws taser into woods. It was his friend's taser. His friend was upset. And I was like, well, I'm going to go get the taser for him, like, you know, boyfriend was stupid to throw it. Like, I'm going to go. So I go outside and I'm going, I'm trying to find where the taser is. Can't find it. But as I'm walking back inside, there's like a little scrap of paper on the ground. And, you know, it's like one of those things like you walk by, you see it, and then you just kind of like look back and then you're like, you just feel something that's like, go pick that up. Mm. And so I turned around and I picked it up and it was, it was literally like a little like fortune cookie yeah. thing, but it wasn't a fortune cookie. It just had a Bible verse written on it, like in pencil. So like, and I can't remember, I wish I could, what the scripture, exactly what it was, Mm -hmm. but I was like, oh my gosh. And I walked inside and I got my boyfriend's Bible and opened it up and found that verse. And it was about like plans and purpose. I don't know what, I don't even know what it was, but I do remember that's what it was about because I was like, okay, Jesus, like I've got to stop doing this. I've got to stop this like party lifestyle. Um, This is not what you want. Right. And I showed it to my boyfriend and he felt the same way. He felt the same conviction. And so we both just like cried and we decided like we weren't really going to drink. We were going to start, stop doing like the other stuff that we were doing. Mm-hmm. And then, and really we did um, for a long time. And then that relationship lasted a few more years and then it didn't work out. Because of all of that, I am like, I'm a better like Christian. Yeah. I'm a better person. Um you know, we don't, I don't drink anymore because I've like learned how like just harmful and damaging that can be. Mm-hmm. And really, I know that I was only doing all that stuff to like try to feel, feel good, feel like accepted. And um, I wanted people around me to 
you know, I wanted to be like them and be cool. Like I thought Mm -hmm. they were, um, but it didn't, I mean, it didn't, Yeah, it just made me even further, like go into like my shell. Cause I did it so that I would be more like talkative. Cause I told you I was really shy, Yeah. but whenever you drink, it's like easier to open up to people. Mm -hmm. But then I was relying so much on that, that, you know, whenever I wasn't doing that, I still like nothing was changing. Yeah. I was even more insecure and even more shy. I didn't know how to like really communicate with people. Yeah. So now I feel like I can actually talk to people and have good, meaningful conversations. And mm-hmm. I don't feel like I have to be anything but myself. I love that. And I'm even like a better self yeah. because I'm not relying on all those things. Yeah. It's just, just me and Jesus. Yeah. I love that. And I think a lot of people can learn because as like, being a Christian, people say they have that pivotal moment in their life. and But I think even hearing you talk, there's a pattern. Mm-hmm. It's like something happens. Okay, I've got to get my life right. Yeah. But it's not like you're perfect. You know, no. you're still going through that sanctification process. Yes. And it's continual. Yeah. I mean, even now I'm not, I don't drink, but I'm not perfect. You know, I fall into gossip sometimes and um, spend too much time just scrolling, not enough time in the Word. And then, you know, I live for worldly things time to time, Mm -hmm. but that's all of us. But the Holy Spirit is there to lovingly convict us Mm -hmm. and like put us back on the path that God wants for us. Because you can look back at all of those life moments and see God so evidently. Oh, yeah. And like now you're closer to Him now than you were in college and really closer to Him than you were even in college than you were in high school. Yeah. So it's like a constant sanctification process, yes, you know, for sure. that's what's beautiful. I think a lot of people get discouraged because they'll have like a moment with God and then they mess up mm-hmm. and then they're like, oh, well, I guess I'm not cut out for this. Right. But really that's the enemy because yeah, he's, so the more, the closer you get to God, the more the devil's going to try to throw things your way to like knock you off the path. Yeah. And it might knock you off the path, but you just get back up, dust off your pants and get back on it. Yeah. And then, and that's, that's life. <laughs> yeah. That's life on this side yeah. of heaven. That's so. the beauty of God's grace too, is that we, he forgives us so much. Oh yeah. You know? Yeah. Cause there's so many times I'm like, I'm so sorry, Lord. I have not been, you know, in the word, like I should, I feel distance from you and then I'll feel close again. Mm-hmm. And then it's, I let the world get in the way, yeah. and then it's like same process. Yes, but each time that process seems like shorter and shorter because yeah, of the I Holy agree. Spirit convicting me, and just God's presence is so big. The further I am in my walk with Him, you mm-hmm. know, yeah, and it's almost like each time you do fall away and come back, like God's presence is even like sweeter. Yeah, like you're just like I don't know, I don't really know how to like say it other than like yeah. how you did, but. Yeah. So, okay, just before we close out, is if there anything that you would like to say to people who might have, you know, be go struggling mm-hmm. with their walk with God or I mean just speaking from experience, you're yeah, you're a high school years are so, like there's so many more stories we could talk about. There's so many more, I know. But just like from what you learned and like to how you are now. Find a good core of like friends, like to have like like-minded beliefs as you, like you're like-minded and find friends in church if you can, because that usually they are going to have the same like goals and values as you, um, because you are who you surround yourself with. And that was a lot of my problem too, is I just wanted to be friends with like the coolest people. And, you know, if, you know, High school's really clicky. And I like, I wanted to be part of the cool click. But that also got me hung up with some people who were doing some of the same things that I was. But I feel like I was doing those things to try to fit in. Have what you, whatever it is that you want, stick to those things. Don't let anything shake it. Hold strong to Jesus and just let him lead you. If you have already like feeling like you've fallen away or you've done bad stuff and God could never forgive you and God can't use you. That is a lie from the enemy yeah. because, I mean, firsthand, like I have done some pretty bad things and um, was far from God at times. And now I feel like he has used my story to bring beauty from ashes, literally, yeah. like took me out of the pits. And not that I'm like living this perfect life by any means, but um, I feel like God would, is proud of me. 
Yes. And I'm proud yeah. of you. Thank you. I loved having you on here. I want to. This was so um, fun. I know. There's probably so many more stories we could talk about. I'll have to have you on again when again. you come back. You'll have to have and again. You'll be back in February. So we'll touch base again. Yay. But thank you for being on here. And thank you guys for watching. We love y'all. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.